Tonight on Talking Politics, a messy redistricting fight in Boston highlights some political fault lines in the city and race is part of the equation. Also, what some intense financial uncertainty could mean for the state budget process, which is about to shift into high gear on Beacon Hill. But first, Politico called it cable carnage, CNN's town hall with Donald Trump, who used the 70-minute forum in front of a friendly audience of likely New Hampshire Republican voters to double down on election fraud lies, call January 6th, 2021 a beautiful day, and at times personally attack moderator Caitlin Collins, who often had trouble getting a word or a fact check in edgewise, including when she asked Trump about a jury's decision to hold him legally liable for sexually abusing writer E. Jean Carroll. They said he didn't rape her. And did I didn't do anything didn't. else either. You know what? Because I have no idea who the hell she is. But Mr. President, I don't know can, who I, this woman can I ask is. you, given your recounting, I don't your know version, who, and, and I tell you this. But Mr. President, are you ready? Can I, can I, and I can swear I ask on you my children, which I'd never do. After the town hall, CNN said in a statement tonight, Caitlin Collins exemplified what it means to be a world-class journalist. She has tough, fair, and revealing questions, and she followed up and fact-checked President Trump in real time to arm voters with crucial information about her position, his positions as he enters the 2024 election as the Republican frontrunner. That is CNN's role and responsibility, to get answers and hold the powerful to account. But try as she might, it wasn't clear Collins actually managed to do either of those things. So what can the rest of the media learn moving forward from what happened in New Hampshire. Joining me with his take is former CNN chief media correspondent Brian Stelter, whose forthcoming book Network of Lies, the epic saga of Fox News, Donald Trump and the battle for American democracy comes out this November. Brian, thanks for being here. Thank you. What was your take on the wisdom of this event before it happened? You know, there's a lot of uh, my former colleagues at CNN, a lot of staffers at CNN who are pretty angry, pretty disturbed by what happened at the town hall. But in many ways, this was inevitable. You know, Caitlin Collins was being placed in an impossible position, uh, and there's a lot of sympathy for her inside CNN. Uh, but there's a lot of frustration that's really, I think, fundamentally about the fact that Donald Trump is running again. If we, if we try to break this down and, and try to get down to what is the essential story here, it's that Donald Trump wants to perform his lies in front of an audience, whether that's on Truth Social or on CNN, and that is a, a fundamental challenge with the media that eight yeah. years later, eight years since he entered the, the race for the first time, uh, we are still wrestling with. Given that he, as you say, wants to run again, given that he was elected in 2020 and that a substantial chunk... Elected America, in 2016. Let's, uh, forgive let's me. not advance the big I lie. I always appreciate some <laughs> real-time fact checks. Um, given that he was elected once in 2016 uh, and that there's a reasonably good chance, I think, that he will be the next president of the United States, at least looking at where things are right now. When we talk about whether the media should cover him differently, whether we should be more critical, whether we should deny him a platform, are we, in a sense, asking if the media should step in and tell the American electorate as a whole, we don't trust you to do the job, mm. we're going to curate for you, we're going to uh, substitute our judgment for yours. And if so, isn't that somewhat problematic. And some journalists do feel that way. You can yeah. see it in, in the more opinionated corners of the American media yeah. saying, do not let this man have power again. He will hurt right. you. Right. That is clearly the message from a lib the actually liberal media in the country. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's an actually conservative media, right, led by Fox, that is making its peace with a future Donald Trump candidacy or a present candidacy and mm -hmm. maybe a future presidency. And then in between, in the middle, are the CNNs, and that's where the struggle is, right? That's where the struggle is. With the Boston Globes and the CNNs and the APs and the New York Times, what do you do? How do you handle this man? And I think it's a lot easier, frankly, for print and digital than it is for television. That's why this controversy about the town hall has erupted, because it, 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 sometimes great television is not great journalism. And that, I think, is the challenge in covering Donald Trump. I, frankly, I thought the town hall was great, great television. I watched it. I was fascinated by it. Um, but it's not always great journalism because of the challenge of interviewing him and the challenge of everybody his lies. So moving forward, when you do put Trump on TV, whether it's for a town hall or a debate, yeah. are there things that didn't go right in New Hampshire this week that the TV media can learn from and say, okay, we're going to um, right. create right. new practices aimed at not having things get out of control the way they got out of control for CNN. Yeah, look, I think it's easy for me to say, you know, a few days later, hey, there should have been on-air uh, ba banners with fact checks. Yeah. There should have been graphics and but other people ways. People were talking about that beforehand, right? They were talking they were. about real-time banners. or. And I think, frankly, all of this is really just at the margins, right? You, you can do things that are have a marginal impact, but at the end of the day, even if Donald Trump is never on CNN again, and after the town hall, I'm not sure he will be back on CNN, 
CNN during this primary cycle, he'll always have Fox, he'll always have Newsmax, mm -hmm. he'll always have Rumble and all of these far-right outlets. He'll always have ways to reach his voters. I think what's significant about the CNN town hall is that when the ratings came in, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure how many viewers would tune in, yeah. maybe five, 10 million viewers. Remember when he was on stage for primary debates eight years ago, 20 million viewers. This time, just 3 million viewers. Just 3 million viewers for the town hall on CNN. That tells me there's exhaustion. There's fatigue. There's a lot of voters, even Republican voters, who just don't want to hear from him anymore. And I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting story, and that's going to be a subplot going forward. How many people are actually invested in a Trump candidacy, and how many just are just want to move on? That is really interesting. As you talk about it, I, I kind of struggle internally to reconcile that with his strong poll numbers, poll numbers including right. that recent Washington Post poll that showed him beating President Biden, leading by, what, eight points, I think, in a hypothetical matchup? Right. Well, if you have to choose, right? You're in, in, yeah. in, and you were, uh, you know, uh, I live in a red town in a red county. And a lot of a lot of my neighbors, uh, they have to choose Trump over Biden. They're going to choose Trump. Doesn't mean they're excited about. It, doesn't mean they want to do it. Doesn't they don't, doesn't mean they're the best. He, doesn't mean they think he's the best man for the job. Yeah, uh, I want to roll another uh, bit of commentary from CNN. I think reported by the New York Times from an internal call. CNN's chairman Chris Lick said afterward the event was a success. He said Caitlin Collins gave a masterful performance, and he added. We all know covering Donald Trump is messy and tricky, and it will continue to be messy and tricky, but it's our job. I absolutely unequivocally believe America was served very well by what we did last night. People woke up and they know what the stakes are in this election in a way that they didn't the day before. Even if you're skeptical about CNN holding this event or the way that it was conducted, it seems to me that Chris Lick raises a reasonable point there, right? Yes. This was a very bracing reminder of who Donald Trump is, what his MO is, and what he'll bring back to the White House if he's reelected. Yeah, look, Lick canceled my show, but uh, looking at this objectively, I, I agree with a lot of what he said on that call. I, I listened into it uh, as, a, as a reporter, wanting to hear what the argument was going to be. My argument is Lick should have made those uh, those comments ahead of time. They should have explained the town hall more ahead of time and not, only, not just defended it afterwards. But I do think it is essential that people understand the stakes of the election, and he is absolutely right about that. Now, whether it has to be live on TV or whether it can be taped, you know, whether the town hall should have a an audience or whether it should be with no audience, those mm -hmm. are fair arguments. I think the reality, though, is Trump wanted an audience. He wanted fans in the room. He wanted, uh, you know, a female moderator. There's certain things that he probably wanted to get out of this because he wants to perform, yeah. uh, you know, in a certain way. He, he wasn't going to sit down and just have an interview like this because it wouldn't be on his terms and he wouldn't have as much of an advantage. Right. So, you know, fundamentally, CNN had to meet him where he wanted to be met. I think I think going forward, we just have to recognize the problem at the end of the day, the challenge here is not necessarily the media or CNN or any of the executives. It is with an environment that is uh, allowed this hyperpartisan lying going on. Uh, there's a, a, a part of our country that was broken by the 2016 election. Uh, this share, shared reality that maybe we used to have at least to some degree. Now it's been filled by conspiracy theories and disinformation led by the former president. That is the challenge. And, you know, for the media, it's an almost impossible task. It's a huge challenge. I can't imagine the media alone fixing it, but if we want to be true to the truth, such as it is, for the duration of this election cycle, are there any ideas uh, that you have or suggestions you have for whether it's, again, TV media, print media, best practices when it comes to covering President Trump, things to either do or not to do? You know, I like to picture, uh, I hope this doesn't make viewers hungry, I like to picture a truth sandwich. You know, if you're, if you're dealing with information that is total nonsense, yep. is baloney, you need to surround it with the truth. You need to put the truth first and then share what Trump is saying and then follow up again with the truth. There are ways in order to package this stuff. And by the way, it doesn't just apply to Trump, right? There are there are some Democratic politicians that sometimes mislead the public. There's sure. certainly other Republicans that do. Trump He's is prolific. Trump is unique in some ways, uh, but this is a challenge more, more broadly. And uh, there are ways for journalists to surround some of this baloney with the truth. And then in a TV event like the town hall, if he says something that is simply untrue, for example, I didn't tell Georgia election officials to find me the votes I needed to win the state, is it fair to suggest that at that point, TV networks need to be ready to grind everything to a halt, mm. to break from format and say, actually, we want to go to the audio because that's exactly what you did and it's mm. important that people hear this. Because it seems to me, I would not have wanted to have to do the job that Caitlin Collins had to do the other day. Right. But if it's just, you're saying one thing and he's saying another and he's not telling the truth, simply going back and forth doesn't convey that. Right? I think it does not convey that, but I, I agree with you. I wouldn't have wanted to be in her position either. I don't think it's a, a position that is, there's no way to, I don't want to say the word win because it's not about winning or losing, but yeah. there's no way to come out feeling great afterwards. There's just not. And that's not the fault of the media. That's the fault of the liar on stage. All right, Brian Stelter, thank you Thanks. for being here to talk it through <laughs> and look forward to the new book. Thanks.
Now that the Massachusetts Senate has released its budget proposal following Governor Healy and the Massachusetts House, Beacon Hill is buckling down for weeks of budget negotiations. But unlike last year when the state took in a massive surplus, current tax revenues coming up dismayingly short of expectations. In April, the state brought in more than $2 billion less than it did in April 2022 putting the state hundreds of millions of dollars behind projections for revenue at this point in the year. And less revenue means less funding for lawmakers' top priorities and for Governor Healy's key campaign promises. What's more, the debt ceiling showdown in D.C. has the potential to wreak financial havoc here and everywhere else. So where does all that uncertainty leave the Senate, the House, and Governor Healy? GBH State House reporter Katie Lannon joins me along with Evan Horowitz, the executive director of Tufts Center for State Policy Analysis. Thank you both for coming in. Katie, since it's the Senate's time to shine, can you just identify maybe a couple of the signature ideas in their budget that we didn't see in the budget proposals from Governor Healy and the House? Absolutely. The big items that they've been touting, um, which they're pitching as kind of workforce development and equity measures, are a proposal to start making community college free for all students. They want to pilot with nursing students this year, hopefully for all students by 2024 under their plan, and they want to extend in-state tuition at public colleges and universities to undocumented immigrants who graduate from high school here. The uh, idea of making community college free for everyone, that goes beyond what Governor Healy is proposing, which is making it free, what, for people who don't have a degree who are 20, is it 23? 25, 25. Yep, that's in Governor Healy's budget. That was something the House agreed to and the Senate wants to go bigger. They leave out some other House initiatives like online lottery and we don't necessarily see the same details for what the Senate wants to do for their tax relief plan, though they've set aside $575 million for it, a little less than the House. Is that carve-out a surprise from your vantage point? Because this has been such a hot topic on Beacon Hill going back to last year. Is it unusual that the Senate's alighting those details? Yeah, I think, you know, we have heard from the Senate president that she definitely wants to do tax relief. She's been talking about that for months. But I think a lot of people expected that the Senate would follow suit with what the governor and the House did and do their tax relief plan in concert with the budget, um, see those specifics. Um, there is some thinking that maybe the, the news we had this month about the April revenue shortfall has mm -hmm got them moving at a bit of a slower pace. Yeah, perfect transition. Thank you for teeing me up. So Evan, last year, the push for tax relief was derailed when the state took in a surplus and it triggered this law that sent money back and to gave tax. gave back the surplus. And, and no one seemed to know that that was even a possibility and it happened. Uh, anyway, now we're dealing with these seemingly to a large number of people, unexpected negative numbers from April. When state policymakers, state lawmakers have this much trouble predicting what's going to happen. Is it smart public policy to be talking about 500 million or in some cases, you know, for the House and, and the governor, 700 plus million in tax relief? Or is that a bad idea? I mean, I, I think it's always smart public policy to be thinking about what is the best thing we can do with taxpayers' dollars. And sometimes it's spend it and sometimes it's give it back um, in targeted ways. Now, I do think April has made people reflect on whether we can really afford the sort of one plus billion dollar annual cost of the tax proposals that have come from the governor's office and from the House. And it's probably both a little bit of caution um, and a little bit of tactics from the Senate side to hold off on their plan for a bit. But I think it makes sense given that, yeah, there's new uncertainty in our tax revenue expectations and we should plan with that uncertainty in mind. You may have just offered me a, a generously delicate on-air correction. The, the tax relief numbers we're talking about over a billion dollars, because I had like a pushing 800 million in my head, but I may be wrong. So there's a lot of gamesmanship in how these things get presented, but I think the right way to think about it is the full cost of the governor's package is a billion dollars a year once it's phased in. The full cost of the House package is $1.1 billion a year once it's phased in. Um, and the Senate actually is being, I think, quite clever in the way that they're presenting this as like the same amount of money as the House. But what they really mean is the same as their first phase. So the Senate oh, can come okay. in and say, actually, this is our full package and it's $600 um, million dollars, and it's the same as the House. But maybe they mean $600 million every year, whereas the House means 600, then 800, then a billion. Um, Crafty. It's, yeah, clever bit of politics. I, I don't know that that's what they're doing, but it's certainly possible. Does that ring true to you, Katie? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be anything. We don't. We only know that that 575 million placeholder is the cost for fiscal year 2024. The House phases in their tax relief plan over a period of multiple years, okay. so that's how you get those kind of mystery numbers. And there's always, you know, different actors on Beacon Hill will talk about the same bill, the same policy, as, with different price tags depending on the. 
situation. That makes me feel slightly better about my inability to attach firm numbers to these things. Evan mentioned a second ago that people may be backtracking, at least in the Senate, or, or indicating their ambivalence when it comes to whether tax relief is a smart move, uh, especially if the number is higher at this point in time. Do you have any sense that people either in the Healy administration or on the House side are backtracking in the wake of those April numbers, or are they just kind of staying the course? They are, they are holding fast. They are saying that this is affordable, that they were expecting a slowdown, that they were expecting some volatility, ups and downs in revenue collections, and that these numbers were, were planned with that dynamic in mind. Now, you know, that's particularly on the House side. That's why Speaker Ron Mariano says they wanted to gradually build up to that full billion dollar number rather than doing a billion dollars in relief all at once to make sure they could afford it. And, you know, I think there's... There's some truth, truth to that for sure, but that they, you know, knew this was not going to be a up, 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 huge, huge revenue year like it really has been. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know whether how much of that is kind of a political posturing and how much of that is this is tracking what they expected. Well, maybe Evan can tell us because you're one of the experts, right, who who gives state lawmakers guidance when it comes to how much money they should expect is, is yeah, going Yeah, I mean, to Katie's being judicious. She's a journalist, which is the only so much she can say, and I'm not a journalist, so I can say more. Excellent. Um, which is that I think that the administration, the, the argument the administration is making, which is they always foresaw this, is uh, implausible. Um, I was there in just January when we were suggesting, uh, as you say, this group of experts, what revenues would look like. And some of us said, your April expectations are wrong. Um, and we're never going to hit the numbers. They had an opportunity to go back and adjust that. And they didn't. Um, so to turn around now and say, yeah, we always knew they, that that was unreasonable. I, I don't think that's right. They missed a window where we were telling them it was unreasonable and they didn't do anything about it. So, I mean, does this mean that their tax packages are unaffordable? Not necessarily. But I think probably they are too big, given the current fiscal picture. Uh, just to be absolutely clear about this, when you're saying that, that it's not quite true to say that people anticipated these numbers, that they were warned, but they didn't anticipate them anyway, are we talking the Healy administration or the House or both? Well, it's the administration that sets the monthly benchmarks and the, uh, well, it's a consensus thing. So all the, all the bodies get together, but really... The lead groups here are on the agency and administrative side who are setting numbers. So hypothetically speaking, maybe since you're uh, not a journalist, you'll be more willing to engage in, in reckless speculation than, than Katie can be. I appreciate if, that characterization of it. Yes. If, we, if we, hopefully this is informed and sophisticated and nuanced speculation, but I think it's reasonable to ask, what if we see numbers in May like we saw in April? What will well, we're happen not going and to. what should Actually, happen? we're not going to. Um, what happened in April had to do with a part of the tax system that's called non-withheld income. And there are only a couple of months where that, that matters. April is one of those months. The next month where that matters is June. So the May numbers are not really going to tell us much, but the June numbers are. Um, and it'll be pretty late in the process by then to make changes for this fiscal year, but it'll matter for next fiscal year. And very often we push up right up against the end of the, the year before we sign a budget. So we could get those, well... It'll be tricky to see the June numbers, but yeah, we're unlikely to see anything meaningful in May. That wasn't as reckless as I was. Sorry, I apologize. For so that. Try to ramp it up in, <laughs> your, in your final <laughs> try answer. Try a different question, Katie. As I mentioned in the intro, the debt ceiling uh, showdown is ongoing in Washington D.C. That could either lead to the debt ceiling not being raised, or it could lead to the debt ceiling being being raised in exchange for some big cuts that Republicans are pushing. Do you have any sense that as they deal with the other uncertainty that we've been discussing up until this point, are the House and Senate and Governor Healy, are they thinking ahead to what the worst case scenario might look like if bad stuff happens with the debt ceiling or cuts related to it? I mean, this is another thing that, you know, when Evan's talking about the, the group of analysts and economists who came in to testify about the budgetary outlook, the debt ceiling questions, at least, were on the radar then. They've been hearing about it. Um, this is certainly the kind of thing that's on the mind of the, you know, budget analysts working in the warren of back offices at the state house. It's not the kind of thing you're hearing about from the people at the podium, right? There's not public messaging going on about mm -hmm. it, and I, they're they're really sticking to the notion that, or the message I should say, that the state's economy is doing good, unemployment's low, revenues are elevated, we're, you know, on a steady ship at least mm -hmm. for now. That you're not. Um, having that variable introduced uh, in the public realm yet. Evan, am I right that is it the state gets, is it 20 or 25 percent of its annual budget revenue from the federal government? I, I think it's one in five, so I think it's about 20 percent, but most of that for dedicated to Medicaid. Most are coming through Medicaid. Yeah. Given that, and given the fact that this debt ceiling impasse is going on as long as it has, should people on Beacon Hill be working to anticipate 
all the bad things that could be happening in less than There are too many bad things. You can't anticipate yeah. all the bad things because there are so many ways for things to go bad. And I think it's, it's disappointing, but it's sort of futile to worry too much about the debt ceiling because there's not much we can do about it. If folks in Washington screw this up, and they may, and by screw this up I mean allow the government to default on its debts for no particular mm -hmm. reason, um, then yeah, the fallout here will be disastrous um, for the economy, for the state budget. Um, but we have very little power here. Uh, we don't elect any Republicans. Uh, there is that, right? Yeah. So we can't pressure local lawmakers. There's just very little that we can do except cross our fingers and hope that they're not as foolish as they seem to be. And just to be clear on this, is your sense that if the ceiling is lifted in exchange for great big cuts, that'll be pretty bad on the, the state and local level too, right? I mean, if it's a package of cuts that looks anything like the Republican House proposal in D.C., yes, that would be quite bad for our state, for states across the country. Well, then we can have both you back. That would be great. All right, Evan Horowitz, Katie Landon, thank you. Thank you. Next up, one of the biggest powers the Boston City Council has is periodically redrawing the map that breaks the city down into districts, which those same city councilors then go on to represent. But this time around, the process has been unusually complicated and politically fraught. Last week, a federal judge tossed out the map the council created last year. That ruling was cheered by a group of councilors who opposed the new map in question, some of whom actually helped pay for the litigation that led to its dismissal. For the record, all those councilors are white and Irish American. Now it is back to the drawing board for the council as a whole, and they've got company. This week, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu said she plans to present a map of her own for the council to consider. So why has this entire process been so difficult? And what bigger lessons might it offer about fault lines in Boston politics right now? I'm joined by GBH News' City Hall correspondent, Soraya Wintersmith, who has been paying close attention to this for months. Soraya, good to see you. Hey, good to see you. So why did a federal judge toss out the redistricting map that the council created last year? The judge sided with opponents in this case who said that race was too heavily used in the map making process in violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Redistricting, it happens every 10 years, like you said, when we take stock of the city's population. And so the process is sort of inherently aware of racial demographics. Mm -hmm. But legally, when we start to explicitly think about race, there's a whole bunch of criteria and nuance that you have to think about race with. So in this case, the judge said that the council did not demonstrate the necessary compelling interest or very good reason for using race very heavily, nor did it demonstrate the required narrowly tailored solution for said good reason. And so to win, the opponents brought snippets of councilors talking in city council meetings about them thinking that it was their job to racially balance the city map. Mm -hmm. And the thing that ultimately did the map in, or the things, were their attempt to address an overpopulation in the Southie district, and then an attempt to, again, racially balance the map making some moves in two neighboring Dorchester districts. And tell me if I've got this right, they were gonna move some very white, uh, very high turnout, you know, politically potent communities out of Frank Baker's district into Brian Worrell's district. A majority black district, that's Thank right. You. Okay, and there's all sorts of other complex considerations too that they're supposed to take into account, right? The, the coherence of neighborhoods or communities, whether a, a shape looks the right way of a district, right? You don't want the gerrymander or crazy Compact, shape. Compact, contiguous, communities of interest. Okay, so now they've got to move really quickly, right? Because these are the districts they're gonna be running to represent in this year's election. That's right. How fast do they have to go? If you are a person that's looking to challenge a sitting city councilor or you want to run for an open seat, you need to ensure that you are within the boundaries of the district where you want to run. You need to know who your constituents are going to be and what their issues are. Mayor Wu has deemed that May 30th is the appropriate deadline for getting the next iteration of a map that can withstand federal scrutiny. And is that why she hopped in this week and said, hey, I'm going to give you my own map? Does it maybe indicate, you know, we got to move fast and also the council may not, in fact, be up to the job of getting this done on time? I would never say that, Adam. We will let voters decide whether the council is up to the job or not. But yes, she has already sent down legislation asking the council to move the dates for potential candidates to do all of that work that we just mentioned collect the signatures, do the applications to get on the ballot. Because as far as we know, we still have a preliminary on September 12th right. and a general on November 7th. One thing that I think might be interesting is as the election season gets in full swing, if anybody's going to act as a foil to Mayor Michelle Wu, this is one of the issues that could be spun into that narrative that she's sort of an imperious 
city executive. Mm, that's interesting. Juicy. Tantalizing. <laughs> so uh, before we wrap up, we got a couple minutes left. A big question for you. There are, as we mentioned in the intro, a couple blocks on the city council. There's a progressive block, which is mostly but not entirely people of color. Mm -hmm. There's the conservative block that pushed to challenge this new map. They are Irish American. Mm -hmm lean more to the right, relatively speaking. When they go back and forth on other issues, not just redistricting, to what extent is race and ways of thinking about race in public life, to what extent is that either at the forefront or uh, you know, against the backdrop of the debates they have? I would say it's a thing that we should always be interrogating if we're watching Boston city politics very closely. Certainly it doesn't drive everything, but we cannot ignore the fact that we've been a majority minority city for a long time in Boston and this council represents really the first time that reflects the city. We also, however you feel about Mayor Michelle Wu or what she has or hasn't done, we are also in a historic administration because she is the first mm -hmm. non-white male city executive. All of these things are happening against a national backdrop where various parts of the world are thinking about diversity and equity and inclusion and systems and fairness yeah. and biases. So again, race doesn't drive everything, but if you consider yourself a person that's watching Boston very closely and you're not interrogating that, I think you're missing a big part of the action. Soraya Wintersmith, that was an absolutely fantastic answer. <laughs> I gotta seriously, I gotta go back and watch that to, to shape my coverage moving forward. Thank you for taking the time to come in. Are you happy to do it? That's it for tonight, but please do come back next week. And in the meantime, tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics, or you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. For now, thank you for watching, and good night. Basic Black is 